By the early 1970s, process safety management in its earliest prototypes was already being used in manufacturers using uh, processes of highly hazardous chemicals uh, throughout the country. And by the early 1980s, you might start seeing variations of process safety management that would be recognizable today, both uh, developed by professional uh, societies in Europe as well as uh, in U.S. corporations. By the early 1980s, there were a series of disasters leading through to 1994, including a very well-publicized one in Bhopal, India, involving Union Carbide, another one involving an ARCO plant. And so by 1994, the U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration promulgated a rule which codified or, or put into a regulation the concept of process safety management. Now, for the first time since 1994, OSHA has published a significant revision and interpretive uh, guidance to, to its process safety management standard. And we're going to talk about that. I'm Manish Rath, and this is the February 28th, 2024 episode of the OSHA 3030. Welcome to the OSHA 3030. I'm Manish Rath. I'm an attorney at Keller and Heckman here in Washington, D.C., and for about 28 years, I've been engaged in representing management in the field of occupational safety and health law and other associated areas of law. And I'm joined today, and I'm very fortunate to be joined today by my good friend and colleague here at Keller and Heckman and on our OSHA team, Taylor Johnson. Taylor, welcome aboard. Manish, pleasure to be here as always. Well, Taylor, I think we've got a great topic. I think it's an important topic, and it's it's one where we really uh, haven't given a lot of uh, other episodes dedicated to to process safety management. There have right. been a few over the years. What are we now in our eleventh year, somewhere in there? Yeah. And uh, and so this is important, and, but it's it's one of the few occasions where OSHA has has revisited the subject. So why don't we start by telling the members of the OSHA thirty thirty community what we're going to talk about? Yeah, sure. Uh, so first, we'll just start with a factual, you know, a bit of a background with respect to the. PSM or the Process Safety Management Standard in general. So what is it? We'll do a quick overview of that. Um, we'll touch briefly on the rulemaking uh, update or, or lack of update, essentially, in this case, with respect to you know the formal rulemaking for the PSM standard and where that's at in the process. Um, and then sort of the topical you know, change that brings us here today, uh, the, this new PSM enforcement manual, um, you know, first time that, that this has been updated in 30 years, sort of a, it's a hundred pages of question and answer, um, kind of an, an aggregation of different letters of interpretation. So we'll go through that. And then as always, you know, we'll wrap up with, uh, with what employers should do. And then Manish, uh, back to doing some, some off the record, so some questions um, from, from our audience members. Sounds great. It's a good plan. Let's get with it. Well, what is it? What is the uh, event today? It's a compliance directive that was published uh, effective January 26th, published, uh, it was signed on on December 14th of 2023, and it's a compliance directive relating to process safety management. Uh, let's talk about process safety management first before we get into what this new compliance directive says. I think to begin with, it's important to understand that this applies to ha highly hazardous chemicals and that it is a, a, a standard that we're talking about, Section 119, and it applies to highly hazardous chemicals in a process. We should talk about what a process is in a moment. Right. Uh, but it is it is a standard that deals with developing a safety plan, training, educating, communicating, and having a system for uh, uh, evaluating the safety of uh, process prior to startup and anytime there's changes. That's it in a nutshell. But when we talk about it, the fact that it applies just to processes involving highly hazardous chemicals, perhaps we should define what a process is. I think this word, as OSHA uses it, as, as the industry uses it, is a little bit confusing because it's not really the, the lay use of the word process. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think when you think process, you think more of action. Um, but you know, interestingly enough, um, as OSHA has defined it here, uh, process means any activity involving a highly hazardous chemical, um, including just the storage of that chemical. So, you know, Manish wouldn't traditionally think that that's a process necessarily just storing a chemical, um, but it includes the use, the storage, the manufacturing, handling, or on-site movement of a highly hazardous chemical. Yeah, and it's the piping systems. It's any interconnected yeah. vessels involving highly hazardous chemicals. And when separate vessels are not interconnected, but they are so closely co-located that the 
event involving one vessel of highly hazardous chemicals might implicate a potential release of a, a closely located other vessel, then those should be considered under Section 119 as a single process for the purpose of developing a compliance plan within an organization or at an establishment for process safety management. Okay, so that's a process. Let's talk about the rule. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is a rulemaking process that has been going on for for quite some time now. Um, so um, during the Obama administration, there was a, a, re a request for information in 2013 that, that kind of set this off. Um, yeah, and that really started with uh, the West Texas disaster. Right. The, the White House sent a directive to, to several agencies, the EPA and OSHA in particular, and said that these are the following standards that we want you to revisit, examine, and see whether they need to be updated in order to prevent uh, disasters involving process safety management. Right. And so that starts this this process. Um, so there's a Sabrifa process that was completed in 2016. I think, you know, much the latest uh, development was a stakeholder meeting in October of 2022. Um, and if you check the, the latest regulatory agenda, it's sort of just, you know, still in the pending process, not even a proposed rule, but just OSHA's continuing to, you know, analyze these comments. Still on there. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So that's, that's the rulemaking initiative that OSHA has been slowly in, and uh, steadily engaged in for more than the past decade. But now what they've done is they've published an enforcement uh, compliance directive. And really, it seems to me what they've done is they've taken a lot of their old letters of interpretation yep. and collated them into a compendium. Yep. And then they've used, because letters of interpretation come in the format of a question posed by a stakeholder, and an answer uh, provided by the agency's uh, folk, then, then what we see here in the format of this compliance directive, uh, when it's collated, all of those, uh, is, is really a question and answer format. And so it, to a certain extent, because of that, it's very difficult to use as a reference manual easily because of that format. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, it, it and it ranges in sort of the the scope from being very broad to extremely specific. And so we'll get into right. that a little bit later in terms of how you can use this for, for your work. Side. So what they're doing here in this compliance directive is this is the uh, compliance office trying to the the directorate of enforcement trying to communicate to the area offices what the area offices should think about when conducting inspections or when receiving complaints, et cetera, and how they should go about conducting those uh, in particular cases where questions have come up over the past uh, several decades since the promulgation of the rule. Right. And then one call out here is that, you know, if you're in a state plan state, um, so within 60 days of when the uh, the enforcement manual was released, so that would be uh, by March 26 of this year, uh, state plan states can either adopt sort of identical enforcement manuals to so just take it whole cloth, or they can do a more effective, more robust policy. So that's something to look out for if you're in a state plan state. Another thing that uh, I think is a significant change is that the audit checklist that was an appendix to the compliance directive uh, is now no longer going to be relied on. In fact, this compliance directive replaces that audit checklist. So, so this is, in OSHA's view, more comprehensive and more up to date. And I would commend employers for that reason to take a look through this question and answer format and compliance directive, try and identify issues that might be might speak to the operations or the peculiarities of your establishments and see what's relevant. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I think we should probably get into a sampling of some of the questions. As you say, there's 100 pages-ish uh, of questions and answers, but we ought to pick just a few and go over them to give you in the OSHA 3030 community, a sense of the kind of uh, questions or the style of questions that are being asked and answered here. So the first one, if the process safety management standard applies to a process, does the employer have to comply with all provisions of the standard? I suppose the person who asked this question was thinking maybe, for example, by analogy, the HASCOM standard, you might only have to uh, comply with certain sections of it in certain instances and all of the standard in other instances. And so I think this is what the stakeholder was asking. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the answer is yes. Um, so when the PSM standard applies um, to a process, the employer then must comply with all the provisions of, of the standard. 
Um, and, and then one of the particular call outs here that OSHA actually writes in the in their response to this question um, in the manual is that um, the employer needs to perform a compliance audit at least every three years. Um, and that's in accordance with Section 1910-119-0. So, so I think that's important. Well, now that you have made a determination, if you've made a determination that your establishment is covered under process safety management, that would involve developing process safety information, uh, process hazard analysis, developing an operating procedure, dealing with the, the give and take, the iterative process of getting employee feedback from employees as well as uh, maybe their representatives, uh, engaging in training as well for the workforces, also for the contractors who might be on the site, uh, doing a pre-startup safety review, uh, anytime there's changes, doing a management of change, et cetera. So these are the kinds of things that now, if you've made a determination that your establishment is subject to the process safety management, standard. These are some of the elements of the standard you'd be entirely committed to. Next question, are there quantities of flammable liquids that when combined with flammable gases would combine to determine if a threshold quantity or TQ has been established or exceeded such that the standard would apply? Yeah, I think what the questioner was getting at here is sort of, you know, when we're talking about about aggregating, you know, the the amounts of hazardous substances, um, you know, do I do I add the amount of flammable gases that I have along with the flammable liquids, or, or is it sort of siloed into these various compartments? Um, and so the answer to this question is is no, they're not combined. So to determine whether or not you've exceeded a threshold quantity, um, you know. Flammable liquids, all of them at your facility are considered in, in the aggregate. And then the same criteria applies to flammable gases. That's interesting because, and I understand where the question's coming from, because clearly you should be aggregating all of your flammable liquids, for example. So if you had multiple containers and each container was well below the threshold quantity, mm -hmm. the amount of flammable liquid in all of the containers that are located in a single location would be aggregated to determine if collectively they exceed the threshold quantity. But that would be strictly for all of those flammable liquids. And then you do it again for all flammable gases, even if they were located in separate containers, separate and disconnected containers even. But you would not add up the quantity of flammable liquids with the quantity of flammable gases. That was what the questioner asked, and that's, that's the answer OSHA provided. The process safety management standard does not apply to retail facilities. And so one questioner asked, are there any industrial sectors where OSHA has carved out an exception to the PSM standard? Not really. There's there's very few. Yeah, I think to sum it up, it would basically be certain segments of agriculture. Um, so, you know, grain and field bean merchant wholesalers, for example, um, farm supplies, merchant wholesalers, you know, there's those particular NAICS codes um, that are actually listed in the in the enforcement manual. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right. Not really. I think it's the way to answer that question. Yeah. And I, and I think it's important to point out that those agricultural sectors do have standards that would apply to them that maybe overlap conceptually, That's right. uh, like the storage and handling of ammonia and hydrous ammonia yep. uh, and other safe handling. Uh, standards and has has whopper for example uh, so so there are standards that would apply even in those limited accepted circumstances uh, for the rest of us in general industry it's important to keep an eye on whether or not the PSM standard section 119 applies to your establishment okay next question yeah so for determining PSM coverage uh, does on-site in one location mean that the process must be under the control of a single employer? Well, it's an interesting question. The, the amount of uh, hazardous material in one location could come from a single employer or from multiple employers. Likewise, the, the possession or the control of those uh, chemicals could be under the control of one employer or several employers. So the, the trigger is really whether or not uh, those several containers of chemicals could, uh, if a release of one could implicate the release of another vessel that's so uh, closely located it, because they're, they're adjacent to each other or contiguously uh, situated, that the, the event would be of one vessel would implicate the, the other vessel. And I don't right. think it really matters whether or not those two separate vessels are either under the ownership or under the control of separate entities. And this happens a lot in 
plant within plant settings. It also happens in oil and gas facilities where a refiner is performing refining operations, maybe for a uh, for an oil and gas company, et cetera. So, so it's a common scenario. And in those yes. cases, OSHA has said it really doesn't matter. It's still, there's still going to be coverage for PSM. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it whether or not it's under your control as an employer or a group of affiliated employers, um, like like you said, Manish, if, if the vessels are interconnected or separate vessels that are you know, sort of co-located, co then yes, the, the PSM standard would apply. All right. Another question. Does informing employees about the PSM program satisfy this requirement that I was describing earlier, the employee participation program requirement under Section 119? Yeah, so surprisingly, uh, to me at least, the answer here was no. Um, you know, in a lot of the OSHA standards that we look at, um, you know, the emergency response you know, standard, for, for example, you know, to have a, a written emergency response plan, um, you just need to essentially develop it and post it. You need to notify the employees of its existence, but you don't actually need to sit down and, and consult with them, you know, the true meaning of the word consult. Um, but here, um, you, the term consult in the standard refers to an actual dialogue between the employees, which I thought was unique. Yeah, it's it's important because what we're talking about now is the development of the process safety uh, management plan, right. and uh, it's not it doesn't fit under the category that you're describing of communication to employees or education or training. Uh, it really comes in under the rubric of the de the collective of developing a safety plan, and the belief that the employees who are dealing with the machinery, the piping, the valves, uh, the pumps, have. A, a perspective that is valuable to the development of safe operating procedures. And so it, it's imperative not just to communicate what the safety requirements are, but to solicit input from those employees who have that unique perspective, yeah. hands-on perspective perhaps, yeah. uh, in, in developing what safe operating procedures should look like. So I it makes sense to me, and it's an important one. So I'm glad a stakeholder asked it and gave OSHA the opportunity to, to clarify that. Um, because I, I think you're right. There's there's sometimes a conflation between this collaborative development of a safe operating procedure and education, communication, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Okay. Next one. So the next question is, is there a time frame uh, for completion of the initial process hazard analysis or, or the, the PHA and for updating and then revalidating the PHA? Well, yes. The initial process hazard analysis has to be done any time prior to the initial startup. So that would be your deadline. And once the establishment is up and running with its process, the uh, establishment or the employer is required to revalidate its process hazard analysis at a minimum every five years. And it can do so more frequently. But if it does so within the five-year period, then that just restarts the five-year clock. It wouldn't go to zero, five, ten without regard to, to other process hazard analysis analyses that have been done in between those intervals. So that would restart the interval to another five-year clock. So I think that's important uh, because it's very difficult to achieve, I'd say, continuity in the staffing uh, mm. that, that can sh secure a commitment to calendaring something for five years out. So it's really a, a question of being very careful about succession planning and knowledge management within an establishment so that that ball doesn't get dropped five years out. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to find some kind of system that's going to work. Yeah. Uh, good question. Can an employer use simplified loop diagrams uh, and flowcharts to describe the logic of control systems and instrument systems in order to meet the requirement that you have to have a written operating procedure under Section 119? Well, that's a fair question. Yeah. And so the answer is slightly nuanced here. I mean, so it, it's no, you can't use them sort of in in lieu of a written plan, but they can be input in, as part of your written plan. Um, so, you know, they, they can't, you can't substitute the the requirement to have actual written, you know, procedures, um, but but you can incorporate them. But I the takeaway here, I think, is just simply you know, presenting schematics, for example, of the plan. Is it going to suffice, you know, this requirement to have a written plan? Right. I think that's yeah. right. It's a supportive uh, style of communicating the written plan, which has to be prosaic in nature. Right. Um, so host employers and co-located uh, subcontractors, is the host employer of a PSM covered establishment responsible for the safety of subcontractors workers? Yeah, interesting question. The answer is yes, um, that it, it, it does. The, the standard here applies to subcontractors 
whose work falls within the scope of covered work, um, which is actually defined, you know, in, in the standard itself. Um, you know, they list a whole bunch of things, you know, maintenance or repair, uh, major renovation, specialty work, et cetera. There's a whole host of sort of what is and what isn't, you know, covered work in the standard. Um, but, it, but if the subcontractor meets that covered work, you know, threshold, um, then the host employer is responsible for the safety of the subcontractor. Yeah. And as a general rule, don't forget that communicating the presence of hazardous materials is still going to uh, be incumbent upon the host employer whenever subcontractors, employees are working around those materials, have the uh, possibility of being exposed during any leak, spill, uh, cleanup activity, et cetera, or, or uh, regular work processes. Great. So good question. I think it's an important one because co-located employees, it's it's been OSHA's expressed position that there there are a lot of reducible incidents or uh, incidents that can be easily eliminated by adding better training for uh, the employees of co-located workers of other employers like subcontractors or temp agencies, et cetera. And I think that that's a really important part of a comprehensive safety and health plan for employers to take a second look at. Yeah. Okay. The last question, uh, an existing facility has a pump and then adds a spare pump that is piped in parallel with that existing pump. Uh, so the question is, does the employer then need to conduct a pre-startup safety review? Yes, I understand the question to refer to the pre-startup if, if the process has been shut down for the installation of the pump. And yes, this to me appears like it is now a change to the system and would therefore require another pre-startup safety review before starting up. OSHA has stated the same in its compliance directive. So one of the things it's going to look at, we can deduce from this element of the compliance directive is if it conducts an inspection is what changes have been made since the last pre-startup safety review to the actual uh, structure of a process. And if there have been any new additions, for example, in this case, a spare pump placed in parallel that implies to me pipes that are drawing and pipes that are putting out uh, output that uh, all should be reflected in a new pre-startup safety review. And I think compliance director, in light of this uh, new uh, inclusion in this compliance directive, will be looking to see if that new pre-startup safety review has been conducted. Uh, so it's really critical every time an establishment makes any changes to its process that it goes through this change management effectively, including a new pre-startup safety review. So Taylor, that's just a sample yes. set of questions out of 100 pages. Certainly. Certainly. And yeah. uh, we, we've we been through the whole thing. Yes. You and I each on yeah. our own. And uh, I think it's it's been interesting to read, interesting to chat with you about after you, you and I have both finished reading it. Yeah. Um, but I think that it's important for employers to, uh, at the outset, it's important for employers who are involved in activities that are covered under Section 119 to go through this themselves and figure out whether they have any questions on how it applies to their establishments. Certainly. I mean, one thing that jumped out to me in, in going through all of it was just how granular some of the questions actually got to the point where they could literally be applying to your direct situation, your direct facility. Um, and it could be great guidance for you to go through and pull those out, sort of aggregate on your own from this document, you know, what's directly applicable to you at your work site. And that could be a great, you know, reference manual for, for you moving forward. That's right. Well, so let's talk about what employers should do in light of this uh, new publication. Certainly those employers who have establishments in federal OSHA states should continue to monitor that rulemaking process that you were talking about at the beginning, which has been going on since 2013 at yeah. various stages, uh, because one day it's very conceivable that it would move from the middle of the list to the top of the list, yeah, uh, and then things will accelerate. So continuing to monitor for that, and and even at the state plan states, if that happens, then it would only be a matter of time before those states would engage in rulemaking processes of their own to make sure that they meet the requ statutory requirement to be at least as effective as uh, the federal system. That's right. And you know, speaking of state plan states, um, with respect to this new enforcement manual, so monitoring for adoption of that guidance uh, or or a more effective guidance. Um, you know, the deadline for that adoption is March 26th. Um, so, so coming up now, um, you know, in about a month. And so just keeping your eye out for that. And with respect to can you, are there additional Q&A, for example, or more robust, you know, sort of interpretations that will be effective, you know, in, in your state plan state? So Taylor, you're saying that that 100-page compliance directive that we've been talking about 
throughout this episode right. will now have to be promulgated or, or published, sorry, at, at the state plan state level. Yes, yes. It's possibly true that all of it or significant parts of it will have to be, especially if the state plans haven't issued interpretations like this right. or they've interpreted in a different direction, come up with a different interpretation. Yeah. I think you're right. The next thing I'd say is review the the compliance directive, which we just talked about, yeah. uh, of the new guidance and try and determine which of the question and answers are are relevant to your operations, your tasks, and yeah. your, your setup. Um, I think that's really important. And to, to work closely with OSHA counsel if you have any questions that, as you go through that process. Yep. Um, so next is to you know update your internal policies um, to no longer reflect this this audit checklist um, that's sort of you know gone by the wayside now with this new revision here in 2024. Um, you know OSHA says in their in the, in this guidance document um, that you know compliance, safety, and health officers in the field should now refer to the national emphasis program on on the PSM standard, which was released in 2017 with respect to, you know, certain, you know, enforcement procedures and policies to carry out in the field. Um, so for those of you sort of looking to look at what the, what the, the coach is going to be looking at in the field to develop your own policies, um, sort of, you know, pivot from that audit checklist now to the NEP. Yeah, I think that's right, Taylor. I'd probably keep that audit checklist on hand. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anything's been I'd have to look. I have not looked yet, but I I yeah. don't believe that significant portions have been overruled. Right. I think certainly. they've simply just uh, been uh, updated and clarified. But to the extent that they've been overruled, then you could scratch those out of your copy of your audit checklist and just use the remnant of it. But I think it's probably a good uh, structure or architecture for the concept of what to expect, uh, either for internal examinations of your own operations or from uh, OSHA right. inspection. Yeah. Uh, then finally, I'd say that uh, the process hazard analysis, th uh, that process should be updated every uh, every five years and, and that you have to retain your PHAs on record for the life of the process. But I think it's the one of the real opportunities for missing this requirement is in succession planning or in changes in staff. And so there has to be a system in place that you can reliably count on to make sure that your five-year anniversary for conducting a, a new PHA is met. And so think about how you're going to achieve that. Talk to others who have successfully implemented programs in terms of how to, to borrow those good ideas and implement them in your establishments. Um, we even see that with the annual training requirements or annual requirements like those found in Lockout Tagout, for example. Yeah. Uh, so five years is just a really long interval. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what employers should do in light of this new compliance directive. I think it's an important development in the field of occupational safety and health law, particularly for those of you who have operations that are subject to Section 119 requirements. That's the OSHA 3030 for February. We are going to post this on our website. As with all of our past uh, 10, 11 years, over 130, 40 OSHA 3030 episodes. Uh, those are on our website, khlaw.com slash OSHA 3030. And we'll also publish that. We'll put a link on our website to a YouTube video with the slides, video and sound. Uh, we also put this up as a podcast. So you can just subscribe and catch it on the road when you are away from your desk. Uh, would you please, if you remember to like or rate the uh, YouTube video as well as the podcast so that they become more easily searchable by those others looking for OSHA law content. Uh, thank you for doing that. The other thing I'd ask, uh, many of you have been able to, to assist in keeping the lifeblood of the OSHA 3030 running strong for these past 10, 11 years, and I'm thankful to all of you, but I'd like you to do it again. Every time you get an invitation in your inbox email, uh, invitation. Please forward it on to at least three others within your organization and at other organizations. Spreading the good word about this podcast and uh, webinar. Uh, the next episode will be on March 27th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And uh, we have sister programs that are coming up soon as well. Uh, let me see if I can get a slide up for that. The TOSCA 3030 and the REACH 3030, April 10th at 1 p.m. for the TOSCA 3030 and 10 a.m for the REACH 3030 Eastern U.S. time. Uh, please share the word about those programs if you are an organization subject to the regulatory schema under TOSCA or REACH. Uh, that's it for this episode's OSHA 3030. We're back live this episode, so we're going to stick around after we turn off the recordings for anyone who wants to stick around with us. 
post some questions. We we prefer that you pre-submit them. We've probably had a few pre-submitted already. We'll tackle those first and we'll stick around off the record for a few more minutes. Thank you all for participating in this month's OSHA 3030. We look forward to seeing you next month. And until then, stay safe.